So very good morning to one and all of you. So my due is to deal about iatrogenic ectasia, one of those very rare complications which has, has become actually even uh, uh, sort of started disappearing, but suddenly it rears this ugly head. So it's come to a point when you're talking of target hematropia, we need to give the best to even to these patients. So this was a graph which was a long back, which was in from US and uh, it was a huge number of eyes which was studied and it was seen that up to 2007 it was laser in situ keratomalosis but after 2007 there was a resurgence of uh, surface ablations and in the Europe there was the phagic IOLs which had come to take a big stand but what was most interesting around this time that there was suddenly a crop of 300 odd eyes who developed ectasia and these were seen to occur in very mild to moderate myopes which sort of raised a kind of a fear that is this something which is being missed and then it became start all the proponents of refractive surgery got together and laid down the ground rules that all of these points which all of us know already should has to be considered and we should be very wary of treating these eyes around the time again ecta ectasia risk soaring system those small skewing of those axes in the topography or those asymmetric astigmatism or a high myope for some of those areas or a thin corneal thickness we need to be extremely cautious when treating them but around 2014 there was a new information that the percentage tissue altered which was hitherto not known that if the PTA which is essentially flap thickness with ablation depth divided by corneal CCT and if this was seen to be more than 40 percent it was seen that there was a 97 percent chance of a prevalence of ectasia but then Santiago and all came up with the understanding there were so many eyes which had a PTA of over 40 percent and they were being treated and they had not had developed ectasia so you cannot say that this is a holy grail of ophthalmology probably you could number it as one of the major risk factors along with the other risk factors so what remains constant and which has to be focused on are those topographic abnormalities. We should be adept at picking up form to stay keratoconus. We should be able to look at the balance and if it is overall D is in the red, we definitely do not exclude these, include these eyes for treatment. We need to understand each topographer has something over the other that Galilees is able to pick up the form for stay cases even earlier. But then we came to understand that if you could do an early detection of keratoconus, come up the stage. If you could do an early detection of keratoconus, that would be something even more wonderful. Like if you could look at the wave. becomes weaker and that amplitude is what is being measured and of course epithelial thickness map and others which I allude to. So today we do understand that what we know about the corneal biomechanics is a tip of the iceberg but you could focus on those eyes which have a deflection amplitude which is weaker especially if you have access to the corvus you realize that there is something more which this is trying to point out. Now this is a topography with a very frank case of keratoconus. The bellin is in the red. But when you look at the corvix, you see that the corneal biomechanics index is in the green. The bad is also sort of close to the green. But the TBI, which is something very specific about corvix, it points out it's in red. So that means it picks up a keratoconus and it is statistically has been found to be more significant in picking up those very early cases of keratoconus. Again, if you look at the epithelial thickness profile, it is seen that overlying the cone, the epithelium tends to become very thin and that is again a very early indicator. So you need to concentrate on the topography and the thickness profile. And that could be an uh, allude you that you're dealing with an, act, uh, an ectasia which could happen. Again, if you have an access to the Bowman's layer mapping, you would find that the Bowman's layer is showing changes or disintegration even before the stromal changes are coming in. Now this was a case of a uh, patient treated well. At that time the OPSCAN topography gave whatever information it did, which seemed to be all telling us that we were dealing with a normal uh, cornea. And the patient comes back after seven years with a frank er keratoconus. So then the answer is how do I manage him? The other eye was not specific. So it becomes necessary 
not to just save the eye, but how would you visually rehabilitate? And then do you wear give glasses, contact lenses, and what more is what you need to think. So at that time, what we did was a cross-linking for this cornea. But would cross-linking be enough is the next question to be answered. What would be your ma management algorithm? Would you look at this eye to progress or would you temporarily fit contact lenses? But I would uh, like us all to remember that the ectasia here is something pathophysiologically different from the other ectasias. Even the diffusion of riboflavin is not known to be so efficacious. And you are actually cross-linking the flap, which is not contributing to the biomechanical thickness. And some of these elastic treated eyes have already a thin cornea. So you would have to wonder which mode of cross-linking would you have to do. But one thing remains constant and clear that you definitely cross-link these eyes. Then once you have decided that you're going to cross-link these eyes, you're not going to wait for progression. Then we have more varieties. You could then look at whether the cone is a central cone or is it an eccentric cone. And if it is a centered cone, the way we stand today, if it is a mild to moderate ectasia, centered cone, corneal thickness is at least 450, you could go ahead and regularize the shape of the cornea, do a topographic guide, topo guided treatment, and then to combine it with cross-linking. Because cross-linking essentially stiffens the cornea and prevents it from progression. But if you could re-regularize the shape of the cornea, wouldn't you improve the BCVA of these eyes? And the kind of ablation pattern is, it flattens the central cone, does a myopic ablation. And the surrounding flatter area, it lifts up. So it does a hyperopic ablation. So it does a both a myopic and a hyperopic ablation, and thus creates a larger, flatter cone, which is able to better withstand the biomechanical strain of the intraocular pressure changes which come in. And there's a typical map which shows a central myopic ablation and a mid-peripheral hyperopic ablation. And this is how this patient came to me with a 624 uncorrected vision, a frank iatrogenic ectasia, underwent a topo guided treatment with cross linking, had a B uncorrected vision of 69 with, with a safe eye. Then the next question comes Would you do it simultaneously no, or would you do it one after the other? Now, it makes sense to do it simultaneously because you can't cross-link and then do laser and remove the cross-link tissue. And if you cross, try to do laser on a cross-link tissue, we do not have the nomograms for this kind of a cornea. And the other advantage of doing it in the same sitting is when you have done a laser ablation, the Bowman's is removed. So there's better diffusion of riboflavin and a better cross-linking which occurs. So it goes without saying there have been innumerable papers which have come forward to say that do it at the same setting. Then the next thing which should come is, would you debride the epithelium mechanically or do you do alcohol or would you do PTK? And now we understand by doing PTK, it just removes the epithelium and some amount of stroma, a 50 micron of aspheric surface it tries to create and that itself is going to improve the BCVA. So the conclusion is go ahead and do a PTK and then do a topo guided treatment and cross-linking. Then there's a newer explosion of information that could you do a customized cross-linking. We know that keratoconus is a focal disease. If you could get more energy in the area of cone and lesser energy in the surrounds, why not do it instead of ablate, uh, giving high energy to the entire cornea? So different patterns were involved, whether sectorial or arc-shaped patterns. And at the same time, there's also an understanding. You could do cross-linking alone. You could do cross-linking with topo-guided uh, PRK. You could do it with intacts. You could do it with phagic ICLs. So there are different ways you could use cross-linking in a keratoconus eye. But now, I have talked about a centered cone. And if it's an eccentric cone, how do you do it? If it is an eccentric cone, you need to bring the cone to the center to give better BCVA. No point just cross-linking this eye. So then, you need to have a clearer cornea. You should have at least 450 micron in the 6 millimeter optic zone. And then you have to see what is the refractive error, whether it's a centered cone or a decentered cone, what is the amount of astigmatism, would you place one ring segment or would you place two ring segments? So if 50% of the cone is within the 3 millimeter zone, it is centered. And if 50% is out of the 3 millimeters, it's a decentered cone. Based on that, if it's a centered cone, you would use symmetric ring segments. If it's a decentered cone, you would use just one ring segment from below and push it up, or use a thinner segment on the upper side. If it is only largely astigmatism, you would use only a single segment because it has a greater local effect. Now, this was another case of an ectasia. 
such so much of uh, astigmatism and sphere this patient had, but underwent an intax with cross-linking and incidentally had a Plano 66, which you cannot promise to all patients, but you can definitely promise that you're going to bring the cone to a more physiological position and then you're going to cross-link that eye. Intax and CXL would be one modality of treating an eccentric cone. And supposing you have already cross-linked that eye and the patient comes to you and you want to do intax, you may have to increase the energy which you're using. You may have to be, be prepared. There'll be little difficulty in insertion of the cone because the cornea is already stiffer. There may be some amount of haze. But so understanding is do it all in the same sitting if you can. And it has been seen that when you do in the same sitting, there seems to be a greater riboflobin co collection in the area of the intact segments. And there seems to be an exaggerated effect of cross-linking and it seems to do better. So then having understood that, now the patient still has some residual error after doing an intact uh, thing, then you could fit a contact lens for this patient. That would take care of it. You could even do one other thing. You could do a PRK over the intact and cross-linked eye. But remember that there may be a little more epithelial hyperplasia along the channels, which has to be borne in mind. If a patient has had intact and CXL and the corneal shape has been regularized, but still a large residual error is there, then wait for six months for the topography and the refraction to stabilize, and then you could go ahead and do a fake ICL, and that, that would debulk the amount of refractive error and give the patient the maximal visual acuity you could improve. Finally, finally, when the, the cornea is hazy, and all the modalities which I spoke of is not possible, then you have DALC, which you can do, and you have any number of cornea guys here who could do a great job of doing a DALC for these eyes. But then the whole story starts again. You do the DALC, then when would you remove the suture? How would you visually rehabilitate the eye? How would you do something little more to improve the vision in this eye? Would you want to combine it with fake ICS? So the essence of my talk here is that we need to understand the patient had a vision of 6-6 when he came to you for a LASIK procedure. He incidentally developed ectasia in spite of your best interests, but your duty at that point is not just to cross-linking him and saying a bye-bye and sending him off with an irregular cornea. You need to think of all these modalities. You need to get access to these modalities and use each of them most judicially to ensure that your patient with iatrogenic ectasia ends up with a 6-6 vision. Thank you very much. Any questions for Dr. Chetra? She has to leave now.